and welcome. Welcome to the Man of the Month series. I'm your host, Michelle Marchant Johnson, and I'm so thrilled and honored to feature today one of my dear friends and colleagues, the wonderful Ken Page. Welcome, Ken. Michelle, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, I'm really excited about what we're going to be speaking about today. So, super honored, and uh, thank you for thinking of me. Yes, Ken. Well, thank you so much for joining me and for your contribution. I can tell you that when I sent out the email for asking the ladies for suggestions on who they'd like to hear from, I got so many responses with your name, and I'm really, truly honored and thrilled to feature you again. So thank I you so much. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. So, Ken, I know so many of the women here will be familiar with you and your work, but I do want to do just a little formal introduction before we jump right in and uh, just officially introduce you. So Ken Page LCSW is a renowned psychotherapist and a leading voice of hope and wisdom for everyone seeking to find and cultivate healthy, lasting love. He is the host of the Deeper Dating podcast and the author of the bestseller, Deeper Dating, how to Drop the Games of Seduction and Discover the Power of Intimacy. I love the title of your book, by the way. Mm, and that's you. such a powerful title. He's a popular Psychology Today blogger and Huffington Post blogger. He's been featured in O, oh, The Oprah Magazine, The New York Times, Cosmopolitan, The Advocate, WPIX TV News, Match.com, Christian Mingle, J-Date, and more. Ken has led hundreds of workshops on intimacy and spirituality for thousands of participants. His work has been highly acclaimed by numerous top thought leaders, including Harville Hendricks and Helen LaKelly Hunt, Ariel Ford, Edward Holloway, MD, Chip Connolly, Judith Orloff, MD, and Catherine Woodward Thomas. Ken lives in Long Beach, New York with his husband and children. So Ken, welcome once again. Thank you so much. So happy to have you here. And I'm really excited about our topic today because I really know that you have so much wisdom to share for the women listening today. And our topic is going to be how to search, how your search for love can heal your entire life. Yeah, yeah. And so this is a really intriguing topic that you've chosen, Ken. Tell me why you've chosen this, and then let's get into how a search for love can heal one's entire life. Mm, yeah. Well, you know, Michelle, if there was one subject that I would want to talk about, if all of the body of my work would be reduced to one subject, this would probably be the subject, because I know for myself, having been single for decades and decades, and decades, chronically single, I called myself. And you're here. <laughs> yes, yes, we know, we know that story. And I actually started a support group for chronically single psychotherapists like myself, because there are a lot of us. And uh, I reached a point where I realized that I had to break out of my patterns. I had to do something different because what I felt like was a failure in love. And I chose to make this a journey of learning because I knew that if I didn't learn new things, I would flail forever and be single forever. And so I kind of embarked on a journey and it's a journey that led to, I guess in a way more love than I ever dreamed possible, but it was not an easy journey. And it was, um, it was an adventure, an adventure of growth. And what I've come to believe and what I say all the time, I say this every episode of my podcast, I say the skills, the true skills of dating are nothing more than the true skills of love. And the true skills of love are the greatest skills of all for a happy life. So when we search for love in a wiser way, when we tackle it as a journey of growth, a few things happen. One thing that happens is we speed our path to love dramatically. And I'm going to talk about steps that you can take, that every viewer can take to dramatically speed your journey to find real healthy love. So that's one thing that happens. The other thing that happens is we heal our being. 
We heal our relationships. And I'm going to be talking about why that is. And as you hear the deeper steps to finding love, you'll get it. You will get it. You will get, this is a journey to my soul. This is a journey to learn how to honor the treasure of who I am. This is a journey that includes the deepest lessons of intimacy that exists. And this is a journey that if I take it, my life will heal. And as you listen to the different steps, and as I guide you through this journey, you'll get that. I think most of you will get it, probably just about all of you will get it. You'll feel it. You'll be excited. You'll feel challenged. You'll feel scared. You'll feel excited. But most of all, you will feel like the me that I really am is the key to finding the love I really seek. And that's the greatest journey of all. It's the journey of treasuring who we are and learning how to treasure others and be ourselves in the world. So that's why when you take this path, Your world heals. Your life heals. Your heart heals. And we'll be talking about all of that today. Mm. Wow, Ken. I mean, just listening to you talk about the journey to love in this way, it kind of gave me the goosebumps. Like, Mm. I just don't think most of us think about the pathway or the gateway to love being this kind of opportunity in the way that you've just described. It's just like, like you said, it creates feelings of excitement, maybe a little bit of fear, maybe a little bit of anticipation, and maybe even like a fresh bit of hope that might have like dimmed over a period of time through experiences or disappointments or heartbreak or being beat up a little bit out there in the dating or relationship world, right? So yeah, it's absolutely. just hearing you talk about it that way, it just like gave me the goosebumps. Like, I'm like, oh, wow, yeah. that's so beautifully said. Mm-hmm. But I don't think we typically think about it that way. <laughs> I know, I know. You know, really, 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 the research shows that the quality of your spousal relationship affects the quality of your life more than anything, including your health. It's a big, big deal. It's a big, 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 big deal. And yet, we the, the information we get, on one hand, over-romanticizes love, makes it seem like this thing that is just endlessly perfect and erotic and gorgeous and fabulous and anything less than that is not real love. So there's an over-romanticization, romanticization, number one. And number two, there's a denigration because we turn this search for love into swipe right, swipe left, into jerky behavior, into a numbers game, into unkindness, a kind of dating culture of unkindness. So at once we over-romanticize it and step on it. And really it is a journey that deserves to be honored in the deepest way. And it is a journey of hope. And I think just about all of you will feel hope by the end of this, by the end of this interview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was really well said too, as far as there can be this over romanticization of love, which can give people unrealistic expectations. Yeah. And can cause them to miss out potentially on relationships that might otherwise be really satisfying and gratifying and joyful. And then there's a denigration where we think of people, we don't, we stop almost thinking of people like people with yeah. the swipe right, swipe right, swipe left kind of approach. And, and it's interesting to me, you know, I just, when you were saying that, I had this flashback and to when I was single and I would go to some, you know, parties or events or gatherings and there would be a lot of other single people there. And I, I had this sense that we were all making judgments about each other, like within a matter of seconds, you know, we were looking at each other and going, Nope, not for me, not for me, not for me, not for me. And I know other people were doing that with me as well. And I had this flashback from being at this one party and I kind of got cornered, you know, it was like wall to wall bodies almost. And I kind of got cornered in a corner for a little while standing next to next to this guy that I had already like checked off my list in my mind and we were kind of cornered there together not in a creepy way but just because it was a crowded party and so I was interacting with him and talking with him where I otherwise wouldn't have 
And it turned out that he was this really, really great, interesting person, this really, really great guy. But I would have never even had the chance to talk with him or get to know him or anything if I hadn't have had that kind of like experience of just kind of being stuck right there with him where uh, there was really no choice but to focus on interacting with him for a short period of time. Huge wisdom lesson right there. And a perfect example of how this process, this wiser approach can really heal our lives. There's something huge here. And that is that because dating is so scary, we reduce to a kind of very primitive level of, do I like them? Do they like me? Um, Am I attracted? Are they attracted? Am I instantly attracted? And are they instantly attracted? And if not, We get out of there fast because we don't want to hurt anyone's feelings and we don't want to get hurt. It's very fear-based. So as we disassemble that fear-based approach, and I'll be talking about how to do this and change it to an approach based on the beauty of your presence and your heart and your discernment, everything changes, including your future in love. Mm. Yeah, and I really, you know, I'm so glad you brought up, I know there are studies out there, and you could probably cite them better than I can, but I know there are studies out there that say the the impact that you were talking about of that primary love relationship increases or decreases the quality of your life in such a dramatic fashion. And when you said even more so than your health, that's something that like really catches one's attention when you hear that. And yet I really do believe that that is true. Yes, I do too. I do too. So, um, so like what more important work could we be doing than this? Right? Exactly, exactly. And so I'd love to jump right in and start offering everybody the map, a kind of deeper, richer map, the map Beautiful. that we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah. So here's, here's I'm going to give you two images. And the first image I'm going to give you is Indiana Jones. Um, So, you know, those kind of like adventure movies. It's not just Indiana Jones. It's all of those kind of like um, kind of mystical, thrillery adventure movies with like ancient temples. So it's always the same kind of thing, right? Like there's this temple and then you don't really think there's necessarily much there, but you go in and you get closer and it seems really important. And the closer you get into the inner sanctum, the more in trouble you're going to be. The more gargoyles come out and spit fire, the more giant balls come to roll over you, whatever. That is a kind of map of what happens as we move toward our deeper authenticity. The fear comes up. In our authenticity, in those kind of inner petals of our being, in our vulnerability, the closer you get to that, the more beautiful you are, the more you radiate your essence, the more passionate you are, the more tender you are, the more interdependent you are, the more amazing you become, but the more vulnerable you become. And that's scary. And all of us have shown these parts of ourselves and had them stepped on or ignored or neglected or denied. And so The theorist Winnicott, a a psychiatrist and brilliant theorist, said so simply he captured the entire journey. And this is what he said. He said, all of us have an authentic self, a real self. But because it's so precious and so vulnerable, we create a false self as a buffer to protect it. And the power of our need to protect our true self is so great that people would often sometimes rather die then put their true self at risk. So that's the image of the journey that we're going to go on. And it doesn't have to be that heavy and scary because the key is, the key is to recognize what's in your inner sanctum and learn to treasure it. And when you do that, everything changes. So the other image that I'm going to give you is an image of a target. And this is the map. This is the map we're going to work with. So just picture a target. And picture that the closer you get to the inside of that target, the bullseye, the bullseye is the beating heart of your humanity. It's your tenderness. It's your passion. It's your authenticity. It's the truest you, and it's holy. It is holy, and it's powerful. 
And another amazing thing about it is when you live there, you somehow magnetize the people who are going to love that part of you. The, and the more you honor it and dignify it, the less attracted you'll be to those t people who step on it. This is an amazing, amazing truth. This is the inner game in your search for love. So we're going to use that target image because the further out you get from that authentic self, that's like the more airbrushed version of you. That's the more defensive version of you. That's the more protected one. That's the one that like quickly swipes, you know, out of fear. Um, it's the one that can't stay present. It's the one that when someone's really available, you start to feel like, oh, God, is there something wrong with this person? Why does he <laughs> like me so much? So that target image is going to be the image. And there are four stages to this journey. And these are the stages I teach in my book, in my intensives, everywhere. And the first stage is the stage of discovering your core gifts. And those are the treasures in the center of the target. But here's the amazing thing. The amazing thing is they're the parts of ourselves where we feel the most insecure. They're the parts of ourselves where we feel, well, I'm not going to show this part of me until I've sealed a deal with somebody. Or that part of me is too tender. I can't expose it. Or I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed of how tender I am there. I'm ashamed of how sensitive I am. I'm ashamed of how fierce and powerful and intense and truth-driven I am. Whatever the shame is, I'm, I'm ashamed of how different I am. There's a lot of shame, and those are the guards at the gate of our inner sanctum because of all the people who have seen our most treasured parts and missed it or stepped on it or denied it. Nothing hurts worse. So we build up these defenses. And the first part of the journey is to discover those orphaned treasures inside us that are our deepest authenticity. And in my book, Deeper Dating, which actually the free gift is the first 70 pages of the book, which teaches you a step-by-step -step process to name and identify and discover your core gifts. And that's the first step. And we're not going to be able to do that in this one interview, but I'm going to offer all of you two thought exercises that will point you right to your core gifts. Okay. So here they are. Then this is kind of truncating a whole journey, but, but I think it really works. The first one is this. If you ask yourself, what are the parts of yourself that in a romantic relationship you feel the most timid to reveal? I'm not talking about parts of your life story that embarrass you. I'm talking about parts of your being, parts of your personality, parts of your nature that you feel the most timid or tender to expose, the most shy, maybe the most embarrassed. You think maybe there's something wrong with those parts of you. Here's what I want to tell you. Those parts are your core gifts. They are your nuclear power. They are your greatest beauty. And the more you claim them and learn to treasure them and see the beauty of them, the more your search for love will change in the most shocking, beautiful, dramatic ways. Maybe not, of course, usually not instantly. It's a journey. It's work. But when you learn to name those parts of yourself that maybe you shunned and you learn to say, they are my greatest treasures. And there are people in the world who are going to treat them with care and preciousness and value. When you make that decision, when you make that choice, not only your dating life changes, your world changes, because those parts of you are your soul. And they're the missing key to a life that's happy and full of meaning. They're the orphaned treasures of your being. And that's the true first part, because they are also the sexiest most romantic, most gorgeous parts of you. They're the parts that your true partner is going to adore the most about you. So mm -hmm. that's the first step in the journey, is to actually discover these core gifts. And the quickest way to do it is to think, what have I been embarrassed to show? What parts of me feel too tender, too passionate to show? And Michelle, if I could speak about you for a bit, if, if you don't mind, because we've talked about this. We've yeah. talked about qualities of tenderness and goodness that had felt stepped on for you in the dating world. And things didn't work for you until you said, you know what? 
that's who I am. I'm going to lead with that and I'm going to live that. And that's when you met your husband, when you made that shift. And that is how we change our worlds. Yeah. And I think that a big part of this, see if this resonates, Ken, is that it's because then we're showing up more authentically, more real. And so potential partners can either resonate with that or not, but we're more likely to draw in or attract someone or invite someone into our lives that does appreciate that real person of who we are rather than that, that false mask of who we're trying to appear to the world where we try to appear perfect and like we've got everything all together and we're afraid to reveal or show those deepest parts of ourselves. It allows for that authenticity. Yes, yes. And our dating culture teaches you, hide that stuff. Don't show that stuff. And that's why most dating advice leads us away from real love, unfortunately. So what you said, Michelle, it's so, so true. Ex exactly right. Exactly what happens. And I would say that the greatest, the, the, the thing closest to magic that I see in the work that I do again and again and again, and it's not easy, it's not fast, but it happens, is that when people choose to embrace these parts of themselves, and when they make a decision, which is step two, we're going to get to that in a minute, to only, only choose people who treasure those parts and with whom their soul feels safe, and we'll get up to that in a minute. When people make those two decisions, I cannot tell you how many times they have come back to my classes, to my groups, to me, and said, I don't understand it. I am meeting kinder people. I am meeting more available people. How is this happening? But it's happening. And I say, yes, yes. This is the magic of what happens when you emanate the beauty of who you are, the truth of who you are. And when you dignify that enough to say, I'm not going to be with anyone who gives me crumbs. I'm not going to be with anyone with whom my heart doesn't feel treasured and valued. And then our worlds change. And that's the deeper, greater path. So that, that kind of leads us to step two. Okay. Should, I, should I jump into that? Yeah, jump in. Okay. So step two, the second stage is this. We can't force our sexual attractions. We can't force our romantic attractions, but we can educate them and we can evolve them. And that mm. really happens. And when we do that, our world changes. So here's a fun fact. If you picture like an attraction spectrum, let's say zero to 10, and the zero people are like the people who don't attract you at all. And the tens are the people who just, they make you weak in the knees, like, like just like you have symptoms, you know, you get really yeah, neurotic, exactly. like you just, you can't stop thinking about them. They just, just, just kill you. Those people. Here's what's really interesting. Couples theory teaches us that those people who are the nines and the tens turn us on so much, not just because they're sexy, but because they embody the worst characteristics of our primary caregivers, usually our parents. It's not conscious. This is all unconscious. Unconsciously, we feel, oh, this person could hurt me in the same way I was so deeply hurt or not seen in my earlier years. But this person could save me if they love me right. They could mm. save me. So our ego wants to go back to the scene of the crime to finally get loved right usually by the wrong person. So this is an amazing, amazing thing. Now, it doesn't mean all the nines and tens are going to be that way, but what it does mean is almost always those people who, like, you thought, well, this is what love is, actually <laughs> thinking something else underneath, which is, if this person loves me, I'm going to be saved from my own lostness. They're the one, if someone that good can rescue me from this pain, I'll be fine. And that's a path to hell. So yeah. this is just one fun fact that teaches us that attraction is a much deeper subject than we're ever taught. And I'm just going to share one concept here. No, two concepts that, will, that have the power to change one's world. So one is this. If you break it down into a very kind of like A and B binary way, very simple way, we all have two attraction circuitries, and they both can feel like love. They're different, but they both can feel like love. 
One is what I call attractions of deprivation. And that's that like, like grab you and pull you kind of feeling when someone almost loves you consistently and when someone <laughs> almost treats you right and when someone almost truly deeply values you or when someone is almost available. And that gets us. It really does. It's human that it gets us. And it gets us because we want to win that love. And it triggers the thing in us that says, I'm not quite good enough. I'm almost good enough. If I get this love, oh, that's it. Those are attractions of deprivation. They feel like love and they almost always turn into hell. They're a slippery slope to pain, but they feel like love. Mm -hmm. And so many of us spend a long time searching for getting those people to love us right. And we search for the intensity of those relationships because they feel white hot, because they trigger ancient fears of abandonment. They trigger our earliest memories of wanting to be loved right and loved fully. But there's another circuitry that every one of us has that some of us have to actually discover. I know for me, I chased the bad boys, being a gay man, I chased the bad boys, the cocky boys, and many of you might relate, um, <laughs> forever and ever and ever. They were the ones that had what I wanted. And ultimately, I discovered my circuitry of attractions of inspiration. And that's the circuitry where I could also be attracted to people who were decent and kind and available and consistent and present. And that's a different circuitry. It doesn't start out white hot usually. It grows as the connection grows. But in these relationships, and this is amazing, the warmth and the safety grows at the same time as the romantic sexual turn on grows. And your feeling of safety and your feeling of goodness rises at the same level that your, that your attraction to this person rises. And when you have both, you have hot sexiness and turn on and romance, and you have a sense of like a deep innate goodness and availability that feels endless from somebody, that's like a bursting happiness. And that's your circuitry of attractions of inspiration. And when you make an existential decision that no more are you going to pursue your attractions of deprivation, no more. When you make that existential decision and you make the existential decision, I'm only going to look for people with whom my soul feels safe. I'm only going to look for people with whom excitement is mixed with goodness in a consistent way. Your future will change, your world will change, your dating life will change, and your heart will change. And that's the power of actually being able to educate our attractions. Is it easy? No. Does it take ongoing rewiring? Absolutely. Is it the path to happiness? Absolutely, yes. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's just, I love that you shared that. It's so powerful. It's mm. so powerful. And I think many can relate to those attractions of deprivation, where you're trying yeah. to, you're trying to become or prove yourself or win this person's love or, or you're trying to get to that point where you think that you're worthy of that person's love. And it's just this endless, painful struggle. And it oh. keeps feeling like I can almost grab the brass ring. Yeah. I almost got it last time. Yeah. 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 So was there something else you wanted to say about this one before we move on to step number three? Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to ask everybody listening right now to take a minute. Do you feel ready to make the choice to say, I'm only going to choose people with whom my soul feels pretty consistently safe? Not perfect, because nobody's perfect. Are you ready to say, I'm only going to choose attractions of inspiration? And if you are, just kind of make a commitment to yourself. Um, and if you do that, really, 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 your future will change. So that's what I want to say there. That's a choice that you can make. And it's a choice that's going to lead to, a it's going to save you a lot of grief. And, and I guess the other thing I want to say there is you have a right to dignify your worth. And you have a right to say, I will not 
be with anyone where I have to prove to him or her or them why they should dignify my work. I need to be with someone who gets it. I give that to them. They give that to me. We screw up because we all screw up. You know, relationships are what they say, a process of rupture and repair. But if you're not with someone who's willing to do the repair and someone who consciously and consistently does not want to create rupture, even though we're human, it happens. If you're not with someone like that, then you're in a path to pain. And this is another thing I'll say. The act of not dignifying your worth is an act of quiet violence against your being. So when you go out in your dating life, just look for those people with whom you are inspired by their goodness and you're inspired by their decency and you feel safe with them. Everyone else, out, not worth your time, I promise you. It's radical stuff, but it will change your future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I believe, Ken, in fact, I say this often, that one of the keys to being with the right person, you know, someone that does value you and, and appreciates you and you feel safe with is not being with the wrong person. The tricky part about this is the wrong person can still be a really nice person. They can still have a lot of qualities that you respect. But if they're not in a position to love and accept you and be there for you in the way that you deserve and that you desire, if it's always that constant struggle, then they're still the wrong person. Thank you. It's not always Thank so you. obvious is what I'm saying. It's not always that they're like a you know nasty, mean, abusive type of person. It's not always so obvious. But I think the struggle, if it's always feeling like a struggle, that may be one gateway sign. And if you're always feeling like you come away from your interactions with someone like diminished or less than or questioning your value or questioning whether you're worthy of being loved, I think those can be some gateway signals. That's so true. And you know, Michelle, what you're saying, I think that when you take this deeper journey, you don't just meet the right person right away. It's this stepping stone kind of process. So Maybe you're meeting people who are kinder, who are more decent, who have these good qualities you're talking about, but they're still not right yet. And you feel frustrated. It's like, this person was so much closer, but they're not really available for a relationship yet. And that's a place to tell yourself, congratulations, you've hit a stepping stone. Your field is changing. This is a marker that you're getting there. So yeah, such an important point. Mm -hmm. And um, and that leads to the third stage. And the third, I'll talk about the third stage and the fourth stage a little bit more briefly. But the third stage is how do you get out there? How do you get out there to meet someone? And I want to say what I think the keys are. I think the th there there are two things to look at that we want to work on that'll give us a really big bang for the buck if we work on them. One is we get familiarized with certain patterns. Like we just go on a particular website and we do the same thing again and again. Or we go to a particular event and we do the same thing again and again. Or we go to parties and we keep doing the same pattern again and again. The first step is really, and this is a very empowering, although difficult step, is to, um, is to recognize what your patterns are. I remember I worked with a therapist who I went to and I said, you've got to help me because I just completely am terrible at dating. I need help. I suck at dating. <laughs> and um, he was very wise and he gave me all these homework assignments. And one homework assignment, because I was in my 20s and would go to clubs to meet people. Um, and uh, so he said, all right, so that's where you go. Go. I learned that that was not the place to meet people later. But he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to a place like that. I want you to look at people. I want you to note the things you tell yourself about you and the things you tell yourself about them. And then I want you to leave and go to a cafe and write them all down. Michelle, it was horrifying. I looked at this list of judgments against me and against other people that were all so fear-based, like you were talking about before. And I just thought, it is no wonder I am not meeting anybody. <laughs> oh my God. That was a really powerful exercise. 
And I remember walking down the street with my dear friend Mindy, bemoaning once again, as I had done countless times before with other friends and other people. She was in from out of town. And, you know, talking about like how I never meet anybody and I don't know what's wrong. And she stopped in the street and she looked at me and she said, Ken, yes, you do. And I know what's wrong too. I know why you're not in a relationship. And I was like, oh, great, Mindy, please tell me, you know, a little sarcastic because as if there could be an answer so easy. And she said, you go to clubs all the time to meet people and um, (laughs) you don't go to events. And this was the important part because a lot of you don't go to clubs, but this was the important part. She said, you don't go to events with people who share your deepest values. And you know damn well, that's where you're going to meet your people. (laughs) And so I felt annoyed. And I thought to myself, A, that's too hard. B, I might not be attracted to anybody there. Whatever the things are that I told myself. And when I met my husband, I still had the same, you know, I had like, I was teaching. I was, I had written my book. No, I hadn't finished writing my book. But there was an event called Gay Family Week. And I had adopted uh, a child. And my intimacy journey, I felt called, so deeply called to be a dad. And I adopted a baby boy from Cambodia. Um, that was a part of my journey. So I was a dad. And um, my mom, who's a very wise and amazing Holocaust survivor, brilliant woman, she said to me, you, Kenny, because she calls me Kenny, she said, Kenny. you are going to Gay Family Week in Provincetown because you're going to meet someone who loves kids or has kids. And I was like, uh, Maybe, maybe, maybe. But she was very insistent in a way that she's not usually. And that still wasn't enough. But then my dear friend, Eileen, who's like a coach to the world, I remember this. She literally backed me into her screen door and put her face in front of mine and said, you are going this year. And I know Eileen loves me. And she had never talked to me that way before. So I said, I'm going. So I went. And guess what? I met my husband there. My wonderful, kind, decent, caring husband. That was 10 years ago. And I had to be forced to go to that damn event. (laughs) So what I want to say to all of you is that's the best. Now, I'm not saying don't look online. Look online. Show who you really are. There's a lot I say about this, but show who you really are. Also go to niche niche websites, dating websites that um, are for people who share your values and interests. But Go to real life things to the degree that you can. Mm -hmm. This chemistry happens there. So it's not easy. Absolutely harness the power of the online world, but reveal who you are. And in real time and also online, go to places and sites with people who share your values or where you'll find people who are more likely to share your values and and women heterosexual women who um you know are saying yeah i know those places it's all women i gotcha but some of those events are not all women some of them have men in them and um unitarian events have men meditation events, outdoors events, these kind of events have men, habitats for humanity, wherever it is. So folks, you got to bite the bullet and get out of your jammies and go to those places. I know it's hard, but I promise you, you will save time if you do that. So those are just some of my thoughts on like how to get out there. Yeah, I, I so appreciate what you're sharing here, Ken. It's so powerful. And the example of how you met your now husband by yeah. going to this event. This When when I work with my clients, we do uh, work, you know, with getting them a profile that really represents them authentically. And I help people navigate online. But I always combine that with creating opportunities for yourself offline. And I think one of the challenges is that, we get in our routines, we get in our patterns, we go the yeah. same places and see the same people every time, every day. And then we're like, I never meet anybody new. I never meet anybody new. And so this cross section that you've talked about where you go to events or look for events that represent your values, your interests, your passions, where there might also be the kind of person that you might want to meet there, in the case of heterosexual women, uh, heterosexual men, that those, that's a sweet spot. And I invite my clients when I work with them to 
actually research those kind of op opportunities, put them on their calendars like it's a commitment or a date for themselves because otherwise the weeks and the months can go by and you never really get around to it because it is easier to stay home in our jammies. Yes, and I just want to say, you know, um, working with someone like you, working with someone like Michelle is just almost definitely going to speed your journey to love dramatically because your heart will be included, your soul will be included, and you will plan and you will take steps and you will, I believe in coaching so deeply. And um, so anyone who's thinking about it, I say, do it, do it. And I think you couldn't do better than having a coach like Michelle. And um, we did not plan this. She is not paying me <laughs> but I it from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. That, I consider that to be an enormous compliment from you mm. because you know how highly I think of you and your work and I really respect you. So I consider that to be a huge compliment. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And it's, it's really true. And should I describe the fourth step now? Please, please. Okay. So the fourth step is this, is that we need to rewire. We learn in, in science that what, why, what fires together, wires together. So if you've done a pattern for a really long time, it's neurologically implanted in your brain and you will need to rewire. That's why for my book, in my book, Deeper Dating, I encourage everybody to get a learning partner that they do this with. And I encourage everyone who's listening to get a coach, to get a learning partner. That's why I offer intensives and classes as well. Don't try to do this alone because it's too big a task and we can't rewire on our own. We just can't. We need an outside eye because you know why? At a lot of critical junctures, we're going to rewire ourselves in the same old way because it's the best we know how. So save time, folks. Get help, get support, get the eye of someone who cares about you, even if it's a peer, someone also searching. My, my book, for example, is built so that people can, can study it with learning partners. All of my classes, everyone gets a learning partner. Um, so when you get out there and you take the steps we described, you will start meeting kinder, more available, and more decent people who are more interested in you. You will because... When you, just the act of deciding to show the real you, and then I just want to say something here about rejection. Our fear of rejection is a powerful, powerful force. It's mm -hmm. powerful and it's profound. And I'm going to tell you in a simple way how to break the spine of your fear of rejection, how to literally transform it. Now, this isn't perfect, and it's not smooth, and it's not easy, but it's dramatic. And here's what it is. It is this. It is to change your intention in dating. And here's what I want to offer to you that you make your new intention. And I think you're going to love this, and I think you're going to get it when you hear it. Here's what it is. Make your new intention in dating. I am going to show my true authentic self. I'm going to show my core gifts. I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be decent. I'm going to be generous. And I am only going to look for people who value that and treasure it and know how to give me the same back. When that's your intention, I remember working with someone, a guy, a young guy who was single and dating and um, in a wonderful relationship now. But I remember when he was dating and he said to me, I used to be so worried about being rejected, but I'm not worried about it anymore because I go out to meet a woman and my intention is different. Now my intention is I'm going to be the real me and I'm going to notice who jives with that and who I jive with. That's going to be my mark of success. And when that becomes your mark of success and that becomes your task, you will sidestep the monster of fear of rejection to an astounding degree, and you'll be much more successful in the process. So there's a process of rewiring that means that you now are going to connect sexuality, romance, and goodness 
and availability all together. And you're going to begin to wire who you're going to be with someone who loves you and accepts you and treasures you. Because if you're not used to that, it's kind of scary. And it's like developing a new taste. And it's a new taste that you can develop and you will develop, but it's a journey. It's a journey to be able to do that. And just like you have personal, like uh, characterological core gifts, you have sexual and romantic core gifts. And they're the places where sexually, romantically, you feel like I'm being the most authentic me. I'm joining my heart and my arrows together, and I'm revealing that. That's a beautiful, beautiful journey when you do it with someone who's safe. When you do it with someone who's not safe, it's not good. It's, not, it's, it's a kind of hell. But when you find someone who's safe and you can rewire sexually and romantically, that's kind of the definition of happiness. So the last piece that I want to say here is a huge, huge scary point, a huge kind of chasm that appears in your search for love in the road, like a giant like kind of hole that you have to get around. And this kept me from love for decades. And I think it's the single greatest saboteur of healthy love that exists on this planet. And it's what I call the wave of distancing. And here's what it is. It's when you meet someone, you find them, there's some kind of a spark, doesn't have to be used, but there's a spark and you like them and they're decent. And all of a sudden, when you see that they are just here, They're not going anywhere. They really like you. They're available on Saturday. They reach out to you on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you feel like, ooh, like maybe this person isn't as wonderful as I thought. Maybe there's someone better. Maybe I should go back to the hunt. Um, or, Or things all of a sudden start irritating you. Like you just hate like his shoes. You just hate his shoes. You just hate his shoes or, or his laugh really irritates you or his taste in music. Just, just forget it. I can't be with someone who likes that kind of music. (laughs) Whatever it is, these things loom up all of a sudden and what they are is fear because your deep down psyche knows that here is someone who could love you. And that's the scariest thing in the world. Because if someone who's not an asshole and not a jerk and is really available is there and you surrender your full weight to the relationship and they drop you, that's the scariest thing of all. And so your psyche protects you by rising up a wave of distance or disinterest or um, avoidance. Now, when that happens, and God knows it destroyed every potential healthy relationship because I just wanted to flee and I didn't have the tools. And I had this bad. I had it bad, that worse than almost anybody I know. So I had to really develop the tools to handle it. And I'm going to teach you, if you're someone who relates to that, what those tools are. There are two tools and they work. The first thing you need to know before we get to the tools is this. I call it the wave because it is a wave. A wave hits you, it slams into you, it takes over your reality, and then it recedes. Most of us run before this wave recedes, but it recedes. And if you do these two steps, and the two steps are these, don't flee this person. Don't flee. Don't flee. And if you're worried that you're going to hurt this person because they've gotten more deeply connected to you and now you're not interested and you have no feelings and you just want to get out of there to protect them and protect yourself, don't do it. Don't do it. Stay. They're an adult. They could take care of themselves. It's worth it to the two of you that you stick around to see what happens next because the wave will pass if you don't run. And if you don't force yourself to do something more intimate than you're ready to do, you do not want to be more sexual at this point than you're ready to be. You do not want to be more intimate at this point than you're ready to be. This is a point where maybe the person says to you, hey, let's have like a really romantic dinner at this French restaurant. And you feel like, oh, no, three hours with this person. That's the last thing I want in the world. (laughs) But... I could go with him and his dog to the park. I wouldn't mind doing that. He's funny. He's nice. I like (laughs) his dog. So you choose to go to the park with his dog instead. Or maybe you think, I don't want to have sex yet. 
But, you know, I could go to the movies with him and holding hands would be really nice. So you allow your, or, or he cracks me up. I want to, um, I want to hang out with this group of friends and him who might, these group of friends of mine that are really funny. And he's just going to be a delight there. So you do that kind of thing. You do something that feels safe and fun and nice. And if you don't flee and you enjoy the good without pressuring yourself, something wonderful is going to happen. And it really will happen. No matter how bad the wave is, the wave will recede and your feelings will come back. And you will say, thank God I didn't leave. And when your feelings come back, and why does nobody teach us this? (laughs) Because it's the biggest destroyer of love there is. But when your feelings come back, something else will happen you'll have a clearer picture of this person and who they are and if they're in fact right for you or not. So that's one of the rewiring tips that I just really want to share with you. And these are kind of like 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 the general kind of map that I want to offer you and I think you can see. I think that people could see if I take this map I will learn to love myself more. If I take this map I will treasure who I am more and I will shine as the person I am. And if I take this map, I get it. I am going to be much more likely to meet someone who's going to really make me happy and who I can build a future with. So this is the wiser, deeper, richer path. And it's a path that we're all invited to. And as somebody who was single for decades, I, for decades, I didn't have a relationship that lasted longer than six weeks. Six weeks was my limit. If I could do it by learning these deeper lessons of love, you can too. And I know people in their 90s. I know people who are profoundly disabled from the neck down. I know so many people whose stories are amazing who found love by learning to honor and treasure their core gifts and lead with them. So this is a path of hope. And Michelle and I are two human beings who have chosen this kind of path and have had success in finding love and are heartfelt committed to helping other people do that. So Michelle, I, you know, I also just really want to thank you because you of so many teachers, I know you emanate goodness, decency, and practicality, and you're like an I mean it kind of person. And anybody who gets to work with you is very blessed. Oh, thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. And this, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for this conversation and what you've shared today, because there are so many gems here. And you've shared so generously and given us so many things to not only think about, but to begin to experiment with and begin to implement and I resonate with the fact that you're saying it's a journey. You know, yeah. we, especially if we've been doing it the same way over and over again for a very long time, some of these things take time for us to like really internalize and really get and really implement. I mean, I know I had to learn things the very hard way. And I repeated a lot of lessons over and over again. <laughs> And how would that not be true? This is one of the most precious, important missions of your entire adult life. How would it not be a big deal? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But as you and I both know too, Ken, despite the struggles we both had, because I too was single for decades, uh, it's worth it. It's a journey that is so worth it. It's your journey. It is your journey. It is the journey back to your heart, your soul, your beauty, and your truths. And what journey is. And the fact that that journey also leads you to love, that to me speaks of an architecture behind behind reality that is very benevolent and very good and very hopeful. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so Ken, I know you've you've mentioned it already and you've so generously offered to share the 70 pages of your wonderful book. And the link for that will be right under this interview. But do you want to share any more? Do you want to say any more about that before we kind of wrap up here? Yeah, you know, I think that 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 this first stage of discovering your core gifts is the foundation stage of this whole journey as I understand it. It's the heart and soul of the 
in my classes, this is always where we start. And we don't, we don't leave this until everybody says, I get my core gifts. I have a felt sense of them and their potential and their promise. So the first part of my book, which is all included in these 70 pages, the first two chapters, describes what your core gifts are and gives you exercises and processes that help you identify and name and celebrate them. So I wouldn't want you to miss that. And you can get that for free. Um, through this link. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for offering that, Ken. That's so generous of you. And of course, ladies, you'll probably want to pick up Ken's entire book, which is available like on Amazon, right, Ken? Absolutely. Available everywhere. And what I also want to say is that if you just go to Deeper Dating Podcast, Dot com, deeperdatingpodcast.com, you'll get to hear all of my episodes in which I go into detail into many of these different issues and also interview wonderful people and including Michelle, who I'm really looking forward to interviewing you. So Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So deeperdatingpodcast.com is another way to kind of learn more about my work. Yeah, and Ken, I want to congratulate you on your podcast. And ladies, I would definitely recommend you check that out too because there's something, well, you can sense it. Ken is just this wonderful, beautiful human being who radiates love. But I love listening to your voice too. There's mm -hmm. something about your voice in the podcast when I listen to it that's just so soothing to me. I just like, oh, it's like I go into this state of zen Mm -hmm. absorbing your wisdom and listening to your voice. So I would definitely recommend that too for all thank those you that so are listening. Much. Yeah. Okay. Well, Ken, I just want to thank you. This has been so wonderful and I'm so grateful that you were willing to be our man of the month. <laughs> oh, I'm so honored. I'm so honored. And I love you, Michelle. And um, I'm just so glad for all of your, that, that I get to share this with all of your followers and so glad that all of your followers have you and your guidance and your wisdom. And I don't oh. say that lightly. I really mean that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ken. And to all of you that have joined us, we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts because the fact that you're here and that you're committed to your own life and having an incredible life and experiencing love is just like we've talked about today, such an important, well, it is the journey really for most yeah, people right. of the adult yeah. life. We learn so much and we grow so much from relationships. And it really can open up so many different things in our lives in a way that nothing else can. So it's yeah. really, really important. Yeah, so we wanna thank everyone for joining us and uh, be sure to pick up Ken's gift. If you haven't already subscribed to my YouTube channel, be sure to do that too and watch your email inbox for more Men of the Month interviews. Thank you so much, Ken. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Michelle. It was a joy.